Crosscut Society. It is the public outreach program of the American Institute for Economic Research, otherwise known as AIER. The purpose of the Bosque Society is to provide a forum for advancing the ideals of free market economics and sound money, property rights, personal liberty, and a free and civil society. If you'd like to learn more about AIER and the Bosque Society, our website address is AIER.org. Today I'm very honored and excited to have Professor Larry White as our, as our featured speaker. He will be speaking on the history of monetary systems from gold-based currencies to government-controlled fiat currencies and the recent development of market-driven cryptocurrencies. He will also examine the reasons for the creation of the Federal Reserve System in 1913 its record of performance and whether market alternatives for money and banking should now be considered over the Federal Reserve System and other central banking authorities. A brief summary of Professor White's background. He is a professor of economics at George Mason University, a distinguished senior fellow with the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and economics at the Mercado Center and a senior fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Monetary and Financial Alternatives. He has been a visiting research fellow with our sponsor, AIER, a visiting lecturer at the Swiss National Bank, and a visiting scholar at the Federal Reserve Bank in Atlanta. Professor White has authored several books on money and banking over the years and just had his latest book published in March of this year, Better Money, Gold, Fiat, or Bitcoin. I just uh, purchased it uh, recently and reading it myself. Here, here's, a, here's a copy. Um, I have, uh, and for, any, for anyone who really wants a better understanding of monetary systems and history of money and banking, uh, I really highly recommend Professor White's book. Uh, Professor White has also written articles on money and banking in leading professional journals, such as the American Economic Review, the Journal of Economic Literature and the Journal of Money, Credit, and Banking. He's also the co-editor of the online journal Econ Journal Watch and hosts, hosts its bi-monthly podcast, EJW Audio, which can be found on the website econjwatch.org. Professor White earned his B, AB in Economics from Harvard University and his MA and PhD in economics from UCLA. <clears throat> For our discussion this afternoon, we scheduled to go to until about 1.30. Professor White's presentation will be, I guess, uh, probably 30 to 40 minutes, which will leave plenty of time for a Q&A uh, session with attendees. So now, uh, I'm happy to turn it over to Professor Larry White. Larry, mm -hmm. over to you. Steve. Uh, he set out a pretty ambitious agenda for this talk, so I'm not sure I'll go into a lot of detail on every point that he mentioned, but really I'm here to sell my book. Uh, as he mentioned, it's uh, available in Kindle, not yet available in an audio version, but we're lobbying the publisher. Uh, and it's not a long book. Uh, just six chapters. First chapter is uh, what I'm going to be mostly emphasizing today. The contrast between markets and governments as providers of money. And we're so used to money being the purview of government that people have lost sight of the history of uh, market provision of money. Uh, and there are a lot of myths that have grown up around uh, the necessity of uh, state control over money. Uh, but the real focus of the book is, is a head-to-head -head comparison or head-to-head-to-head -to -head -to -head comparison among the status quo system we've got, which is a fiat money system, that is money by decree, money that's not backed by any commodity, not redeemable for any commodity. Uh, but it, its value is basically uh, rests on its receivability and tax payments. It doesn't have any other built-in purpose. Uh, contrast between that and the gold standard, 
where I draw a lot on the history of the classical gold standard and banking systems built on the gold standard. Uh, and then there's a third possibility nowadays, which is a Bitcoin standard. And when I look into it, I find that it's really not a very plausible monetary standard. It's not likely to be popular because its value is so volatile. So that's the sort of main thrust of the last two chapters. But let me talk about the fundamental issues here, uh, that, that there is a choice between market institutions and state institutions in providing money. There's a standard theory in economics, I don't know how many of you are former economics majors or recovering economists, but uh, that when you're asked why government should do something, the standard rationale is it should do it if it's a public good, meaning it's something that markets can't effectively provide because it's hard to price on a user pays basis. So if you got something like, I don't know, repairing a hole in the ozone layer, it's hard to penalize the people who don't chip in. <clears throat> uh, we're not gonna fix the ozone layer over your backyard unless you pay. So that's excludability. That's a problem with some things and some imagined things. But it's not a problem with money. Right? The money that's in your pocket is, is not in anybody else's pocket. The money in your bank account is not in anybody else's bank account. So it's easy to exclude people from having money if they don't pay for it. They don't provide some goods and services or labor uh, in exchange for it. So that makes it kind of a puzzle why it came to be uh, produced by governments, because there's no evident market failure. And if you look into the history of money provision, there's lots of private market provision of money in various forms, coins, bank deposits, uh, bank notes. So it's optional whether we have government control of money. And if we do, what do we get versus what do we get if we leave it to the market? And what, if, what would it mean to leave it to the market? There would have to be some other monetary standard. Historically, it was, well, first the silver standard and then the gold standard. Today, as I mentioned, there's Bitcoin is a possibility. Of course, there are a thousand other cryptocurrencies, but none of them is really a plausible candidate. So the bigger question uh, for the comparison contrast is how do we think money would work under private provision? So that's where a lot of my professional colleagues just have a big blank spot. Uh, they've never thought about alternatives to the status quo, except in, they might think they know a little about the gold standard, but it's really disappointing how little they know about how it actually works in theory and how it worked historically. Uh, that's why I have a whole chapter of the book devoted to rebutting myths about how the gold standard works, including some misconceptions on the part of those who defend the gold standard, uh, who attribute it to, uh, attribute some kind of magical properties to it that it doesn't really have. If you go back to the question of where money came from, there are two theories out there. Uh, one you might call the state theory of money, that's what it's historically been called, and the notion is some wise king came up with the idea. Uh, and the alternative is a market origin, which is symbolized, this is the emblem of the Association for Private Enterprise Education. It's supposed to be a picture of Adam Smith's invisible hand. Now, it's kind of a paradox, of course, to have a picture of an invisible hand. <laughs> if you had a literal invisible hand, it wouldn't make much of a logo for any organization, but that's uh, the invisible hand uh, governing the world. But the invisible hand is a metaphor for the ordering forces of a marketplace. Uh, people driven by profit and loss will home in on the set of arrangements that best serves the public. It's invisible in the sense that people aren't, uh, as Adam Smith famously explained, people aren't aiming to promote the greatest good uh, 
of the public, but their actions in a competitive environment have to be consistent with that uh, for them to survive. So people are led as if by uh, an invisible hand. It's actually a decentralized feedback system. So Adam Smith understood that money was a creature of the market. It had arisen by consent, that's the way he put it. He didn't really explain step by step how that had come about. For that, I think the best explanation is the, given by the Austrian economist Karl Menger, who said, uh, look, we, we've historically gone from barter to commodity money, and you can think of the process of emergence of a commodity money in two stages. In the first stage, people realize it's difficult to barter. You come to market with plaid shirts and you want to go home with asparagus. You have to find an asparagus seller who wants plaid shirts. That's a difficult match to find. So you're better off if you could trade your plaid shirts for anything that's more likely to be accepted by an asparagus seller or any seller at random. You may not have met the asparagus seller yet. So trade your less marketable good, the good has fewer takers, for something that's more popular, more marketable was the term Menger used. So people move from direct exchange, trying to make just one trade, to indirect exchange, trade what you've got for something that puts you in a better position to be able to buy the stuff you want to go home with. So that's indirect exchange. And then the second stage is people may have hit upon different media of indirect exchange. Some people may be using salt, some may be using peppercorns. You look in the historical record, you find barley, silver, nails. But if you're looking to make your trades easily, you'll be on the lookout for what other people are more likely to accept. So if you see a bunch of people trading in salt, now you know that if you take salt, you can buy stuff from them. So if you start accepting salt in order to trade with that group, you just enlarge the group of people who accept payment in salt by one. And so it becomes a self-reinforcing process, a kind of snowball rolling down the hill, picking up size. So that's convergence on a commonly accepted medium of exchange. And among commodity monies, you know, there used to be places that use shells and barley and all kinds of odd commodities, but gold and silver won out over time uh, when areas that didn't have gold or silver came into contact with people who were using precious metals. They said, well, that's a little more convenient than what we're using. More convenient in the sense that it's more durable or portable or meaning non-bulky or there's less variation in quality. That actually was a problem with raw gold and silver, but once coinage was invented, now you've got pieces of uniform composition, at least that's what they're supposed to be, uh, and that enabled gold and silver, the silver especially, to drive out other commodity monies. So most of the world, most of the ancient world and the medieval world up through the Renaissance really until the 1700s is on a silver standard. So that's a spontaneous market origin of, of a commonly accepted medium of exchange or of money. What does the state theory says? It says, no, it was invented by a wise king uh, or the way Charles Goodhart put it, currency becomes money primarily because the coins are struck with the insignia of sovereignty. Actually, we've got lots of ancient coins that don't have any insignia of sovereignty on them. There's one at the bottom, that's an ancient Indian coin. It's got stamps on it, but the stamps indicate what it weighs uh, and who coined it. Because you, need, you want a brand name in something where you can't just by looking at it tell what the quality is. But uh, you know, well-known mint masters had an incentive to develop a reputation for providing uh, honest coins, and they did. The very fact that coins are valued by weight tells you it's not just the insignia that gives it its value, it's the metallic content that gives it value. Uh, 
Pack silver was a, a form of money which was just made of sort of random pieces of silver clipped into convenient sizes. Has no insignias on it, has nothing stamped on it. It's just valued for its precious metal content. Uh, and there were experiences with privately minted coins. They were unusual because governments pretty quickly on discovered the revenue potential of owning the mint. Uh, and barring competition with the state mint, that meant they could charge monopoly prices for the service of coining your metal. And they could make profit a second way, which was passing coins off at something above their metallic content. They would debase the coins. Uh, so when you read in uh, textbooks that governments took over the mints in order to ensure the quality of the coinage. You just have to laugh if you know anything about the history of state-run mints. They notoriously debased the coinage. All through the Roman Empire, the silver content of the coins was getting smaller and smaller. Uh, through the Middle Ages, the same thing. And it was a big source of revenue, especially if you were fighting a war, you would call in all the coins and remint them with half the silver content. And now you got a big pile of silver to pay mercenaries. And it was a, like 70% of the revenue of some sovereigns uh, in emergencies. Eventually, a, a representative kind of money uh, is issued banknotes, which are claims to gold and silver, but the piece of paper doesn't have any gold or silver in it. You have to take it to the bank to get coins for it. That became a very popular the most popular kind of money in the 19th century. It doesn't have any insignias of sovereignty on it. It's issued by private commercial banks. Uh, and this happens around the world where banking systems develop. Uh, last year, I published a paper specifically on private coinage in the United States in the 19th century. I learned a lot from writing the paper. It turns out there were three episodes, uh, three gold rushes in the United States, and in each of them, there were private mints established <coughs> because the miners are coming out of the mines or if they're panning in streams, they've got gold dust or gold nuggets. What are they gonna do with them? They're hard to spend because the person you're asking to accept them doesn't know how pure they are, so they're gonna discount it heavily. They're gonna assume that you're trying to pass off the lowest grade you can. And that means you're gonna get less for your gold than if you had it certified as to its weight and purity, its fineness. And that's the service that private mints provided. You bring us the gold, we'll stamp it. Uh, the first really successful mint, private mint in the United States was uh, operated by a family in North Carolina. There was a gold rush in the Southern Appalachians called the Bechler family. Uh, and Beckler was a very talented uh, essayer and mint master, and he produced millions of dollars worth of coins, uh, and they were very popular and circulated very widely through the South. They, they continued to be the most popular money during the Civil War, because nobody would take Confederate money if they could avoid it. Uh, so they stayed in business. In California, there were several mints that were started at the very beginning of the gold rush that they didn't really know what they were doing, and so they were producing underweight coins, or they were deliberately producing underweight coins and trying to pass them off. But they only stayed in business for a month or two before there was a report in the newspaper. These coins have been inspected and they're underweight. Don't take them or discount them very heavily. And those mints went out of business, and the mints that survived more than a year were the ones that minted honestly. And so the vast majority of the privately minted coins in California were full weight. Uh, so there wasn't any market failure here to produce quality money. Uh, and the lesson I draw from this is before you assume that uh, if there's a call for government to mint some produce some new kind of money, ask yourself whether there's really any market failure to do so. So there's a debate these days about uh, central bank digital currency. On my drive here, on the median, on the Braddock Road in Fairfax, I guess actually at that point I was in Falls Church, 
there was a sign in the meeting that said, reject digital currency. <laughs> wow, this is getting more popular traction than I realized. I assume they meant central bank digital currency because, you know, Venmo is perfectly okay. <laughs> That's digital currency in the same sense. But people who call for central bank digital currency seem to think that there wouldn't be any digital currency if the central bank, the Federal Reserve, didn't provide it, but that's that's just uh, silly. That's just blind. Uh, or they think that the government would be better at it, but no reason to think so. So as I said, government mints actually in practice debased the coinage, and they did so because that was the source of revenue. They also made themselves the only legal purchaser of gold and silver so that they could pay low prices for it without having you take it elsewhere. All right, so the Spanish Mint made it a rule that anybody, well, they owned the mines in the New World, the government did. So under Spanish law, the government owns subsurface minerals. Uh, anybody who brought silver and gold into Spain had to take it to the Mint and sell it to the Mint. So you couldn't, they had a problem with smuggling, of course, because the Spanish Mint is paying a low price. There's an incentive to divert the ships to some mint that's paying a better price. But that was the law, so that they could make a bigger profit. Uh, and the pictures at the bottom here show the degradation of the Roman coinage from being mostly silver to being, you know, hardly any silver and mostly tarnish. Well, uh, so in the Middle Ages, you had this problem. Every little principality, and you know, Italy consisted of hundreds of little principalities, uh, had its own mint and debased its coinage. So it was quite confusing to go from, I don't know, Milan to Venice. It's a whole different set of coins in Venice. They don't know your coins from Milan, they don't trust them. So there's a money changing business which consists of buying out of town coins in exchange for local coins that will be accepted locally. And it's from these money changers that banking arises. And this has happened by about 1200 AD, we have solid evidence that this money, uh, this kind of business is going on, of taking in coins and giving people deposit credit for it. That is, you know, deposit banking with uh, transferable deposits. They didn't have checks yet, but if you wanted to transfer money, you went to the banker and said, you know, move the money from my account to somebody else's account. Uh, and the big service, the reason people would take their coins to the banker was that the banker would keep the accounts in pure silver units and avoid all the confusion about what the coins were actually worth. So this is a picture of an Italian <coughs> banker, Credito Italiano, and what's he doing? He, in his left hand, he's got a balance scale. He's weighing the coins that the customer has brought in. He has some estimate of the average purity, but he needs to multiply that by the weight to know how much pure silver is here. And then he, in his book, he's writing with his quill pen, he's writing, a, a, adding those funds to the customer's account. Right, so he's recording the deposit that's been added. But by having a, Bank money, but having money in the bank, having a bank deposit that was transferable when you wanted to make a payment, you avoided the hassle of the person receiving coins having to say, I don't know what quality these coins are. We're going to have to test them, which is a hassle. And of course, you avoided lugging coins around from trade fair to trade fair. Uh, so the private sector stepped in to provide better quality money, more convenient money when the states were abusing the monopoly of the mint and producing lousy money. After deposit money, uh, banks introduced paper currency, and the advantage of that over a deposit is the person who accepts it doesn't need to have a bank account. And banknotes become the most popular kind of money in the 19th century, so more than half of bank liabilities were in currency form rather than deposit form in the middle of the 19th century. Workers got paid with an envelope stuffed with banknotes. 
instead of a check because they didn't have checking accounts. Only business people had checking accounts. And the pictures here are one of the earliest ones I could find a picture of, of online from 1729. London goldsmiths uh, were issuing, were taking deposits and issuing banknotes as early as 1650, well before the Bank of England came along. Bank of England did not invent the banknote. And this one's from the uh, California in 1864. When the rest of the union went off the gold standard, California stayed on the gold standard. They didn't have any banks, they didn't have any banknotes yet, so you had to pay in coins. Now, the greenback, right, the irredeemable paper money issued by the union government, was legal tender in California. So in principle, or in law, you could have paid your $100 debt with $100 in greenbacks and said, we're done, but you'd have been shot because Californians were denominating their debts in gold units and they weren't going to take greenbacks, which were at a deep discount against gold. So in order to provide a paper currency, they, uh, Congress passed a special law enabling gold redeemable banknotes just in California. So that's what this is. Redeemable in gold coin, it says right at the top, which uh, other banknotes in the East didn't say. They just said, you know, redeemable in lawful money, but that point, lawful money was greenbacks. Now, uh, people sometimes get puzzled and say, well, if you have you know, 20 banks and they're each issuing their own currency, doesn't that create chaos? And the answer is these are not 20 separate monetary units. These are all denominated in dollars. And it's in the interest of the bankers to make sure they circulate at face value that you know, a dollar in my banknote will be accepted as worth a dollar uh, if you go to deposit it in a different bank or if you go to spend it somewhere else. And that was the common experience around the world in banking systems that allowed the banks to have branch networks for redeeming their currency wherever you took it. Uh, because non -par money falling below par is a big inconvenience. In the United States, we were unusual in having a problem of non-par circulation, and that's because we didn't allow branch banking. State governments wouldn't let banks from out of state in. So if you had a bank in Cincinnati, you could not set up an agency in Philadelphia or New York to redeem your Cincinnati banknotes. And there really wasn't enough uh, business to you know, make a deal with a bank that far away. So it was a hassle to transport money across state lines, basically. Uh, there were some exceptions. In New England, there was a system set up by a bank in Boston called the Suffolk Bank, which accepted banknotes from all over New England. So there, there was par circulation throughout New England. And in major cities, they would set up agreements between the banks in the city and banks in the suburbs. So you didn't have a problem you know, when you went to uh, but in other countries, it, uh, it extended throughout the country um, where the notes were circulating at par because that was the way to attract more customers. Say, look, we, our banknotes or our checking accounts, they'll be accepted at 100 cents on the dollar wherever you go. So freely evolved banking systems based on gold and silver coin had monies denominated in a gold or silver unit. In the United States, it was called the dollar. In Britain, it was called the pound sterling. It went by different names in different countries. Uh, but most people didn't carry coins around. They carried banknotes or they wrote checks. So many issuers, but all denominated in the same unit. And they're linked into a unified system, but without a central bank. The institution at the center of the agreement to accept one another, banks accepting one another's liabilities at face value was the commercial bank clearinghouse. But the clearinghouses were private institutions. There was one in every major city, and there were agreements uh, between cities. Uh, 
So the clearinghouses played the important roles that the Federal Reserve later nationalized uh, on a, as a private you know, member-based organization. And this is the kind of outcome you see not just in Scotland or Canada as another leading example. So Canada had a pretty free banking system while the US had these restrictions on branching and re other restrictions on note issue uh, and a much sounder banking system. So you see these kind of uh, free banking arrangements in Scotland, Canada, Sweden, New England I mentioned, and about 50 more places around the globe. Basically every British colony had a free banking system uh, and many uh, independent countries had it. The U.S. was unusual, and the fragility of the U.S. banking system was unusual. And so it's frustrating to me when I see other economists and when I see, let's see, Lael Brainerd, uh, when she was a member of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System, saying, well, we can't have privately issued digital currency because look what happened in the U.S. in the early 19th century. We had wildcat banking. We had this unstable banking system. Yeah, we did have an unstable banking system, but not because it was competitive, because of legal restrictions that weakened the banks, the restrictions on branching and the restrictions on note issue. Uh, but those who understood what was going on, mostly inspired by Adam Smith's discussion of how well the Scottish banking system worked, uh, which was a very free banking system, uh, said, look, it's better to have competition in note issue, and today I would say it's better to have competition in digital currency issue rather than one single point of failure. Uh, no bank can issue you know, unlimited numbers of notes because they'll get collected by other banks who will bring them back for redemption. And they'll drain the bank of reserves if it issues too many liabilities. So that was a disciplinary mechanism. Uh, Silicon Valley Bank found out about this disciplinary mechanism. Unfortunately for them, they didn't have enough reserves to meet the, all the outflows that occurred once their depositors discovered that they were insolvent. But if you have lots of issuers of money, uh, you decentralize the issue of, of currency, then one institution may be badly run, but it doesn't bring down the whole system. And in the aggregate, some banks might issue a little too much, some might issue a little too little, and those will cancel out. But any bank that systematically tries to issue more than the public is prepared to hold will be drained of reserves. Whereas, and that will be corrected pretty quickly because it's surrounded by other banks. Whereas if you only have one issuer and it makes a mistake, that mistake is gonna be a big one. It's gonna affect the entire system. So when the Bank of England was issuing two thirds of all the currency in Great Britain, because it had a legal monopoly on issuing in, a, in Greater London, it was a big deal. It would cause a boom and a bust. They would flood the market with cheap credit, then gold would flow out of the country in response to high prices, and then the bank had to suddenly contract. Right? So this problem of stop, go, or you know, expand, expand, expand until inflation and then contract, contract, contract until banks start breaking. That cycle's been going on a long time and it's kind of built into having one money issuer who has very slow feedback. Uh, there is an error correction mechanism, but it's very, much, very slow and allows business cycles before it takes place. So, the Bank of England was the first, but others in other countries, government central banks took over. And the point I want to emphasize is that this is not a natural evolution. There's no necessity of having a single bank of issue. Uh, it was created by legislation. In the US, it wasn't until the 1930s that legislation took the right of no issue away from commercial banks. When a central bank becomes the only issuer, it becomes the only holder of gold reserves. And then if they decide to stop redeeming, you're stuck. You 
there's nobody else, no other currency to turn to. And so the country goes off the gold standard and onto a fiat standard. And in the US, that happened in two steps. In the 1930s, the right of note issue was taken away from other banks. Citizens were compelled by law to turn in all their gold coins to the Federal Reserve System. So you couldn't stay on the gold standard by transacting in coins. Uh, so now the Fed has all the gold and the Fed decides, well, not sorry, the Fed doesn't decide, Congress and the President decide that US citizens may no longer uh, hold gold coins. I, I guess that's why they turned them in, sorry. Um, and then the US devalues the dollar uh, and so that's the first step. We're no longer on a domestic gold standard. You can't use gold coins. You can't use, banks can no longer issue liabilities redeemable in gold. But the dollar continued to be redeemable for foreign central banks. And after the Second World War, the Bretton Woods system formalized that system where other currencies were redeemable for US dollars and the dollar was redeemable for gold at $35 an ounce. And that lasted until the US decided that, you know, it's, it's a constraint, it's, it's a hassle to have to provide the gold to redeem the dollar. It would be easier to back the dollar with something that's easier to come by, namely nothing. <laughs> so let's just close the gold window and that's what Richard Nixon did in 1971. So do we need a central bank? Well, if you're on a fiat standard, somebody's got to issue the fiat money, and that will be a central bank. Uh, Alan Greenspan, after he retired from the Fed, uh, was plugging his book, I think it was called Not My Fault, something like that, <laughs> went on The Daily Show, and somebody wrote some good questions for Jon Stewart. I'm pretty sure John didn't write them himself. Uh, and he's putting Greenspan on the spot saying, hey, you're a free market economist and yet you are running a federal agency that was planning interest rates and the banking system in a free market. Why do we have a Fed? Why doesn't the market regulate interest rates and money? And Greenspan was kind of stunned, but he finally gathered a response and said, well, you're right. You don't need a central bank when you're on a gold standard. This is actually less clear than Greenspan usually is, but get the gist of what he's saying. All the automatic things occurred because people would buy and sell gold and the market would do what the Fed does now, meaning regulate the quantity of money. And of course, the US was on a gold standard when the Federal Reserve Act was passed. So Greenspan is saying we didn't need the Federal Reserve Act, at least as far as controlling the supply of money. And that's right, it wasn't passed to control the supply of money, it was passed to try to bail out banks that were in trouble because of the legal restrictions on banks. The, the main function of the Federal Reserve Act was to create a lender of last resort. But uh, just to drive the point home, John Stewart says, so we're not currently in a free market. And Green says, that's, that's right. To the extent there's a central bank, that's not a free market. So that's the, the tension I wanna highlight here between having a free, market and having a central bank. So, as I mentioned, the Fed was created to remedy the problem of banking panics, and the banking panics were due to legal restrictions on the banks. How can I say that? Look at Canada, north of the border, same economy, very agricultural, spread out from coast to coast, no panics, nobody calling for a central bank because there wasn't any problem. So in the Federal Reserve Act, we get an institution that nationalizes what the clearinghouse associations were already doing, running the settlement system, enforcing standards on members. So clearinghouses already had capital requirements to be a member. They had to know that you were actually gonna pay at the end of the day. And they actually sent in auditors to be a member of the clearinghouse. You had to agree to let their auditors in to make sure you really were solvent. So the first bank auditors in the US are not government employees. Uh, and the Fed was supposed to issue currency when more currency was demanded. The commercial banks weren't allowed to do that under the law. Uh, 
online, there's a, a good account of the Fed's origin uh, written by George Selgin. It's on the, the Cato uh, blog called Alt M. All right, so that's the 20th century. We went off the gold standard. There's Nixon making the announcement. I actually had to paste his picture into the TV. <laughs> the tricks you learn in PowerPoint. And so since then, we've had pure fiat monies. All right, but now we've got two alternatives. The gold standard is still an alternative, and its main virtue is that it's more stable in purchasing power. If you look at the track record, it's very clear. Inflation is lower and steadier, closer, very close to zero uh, in any particular year. And basically, I mean, within half a percentage point of zero over long horizons. The main drawback of a gold standard is that the government, it's vulnerable to government taking it over. Uh, if you got vaults full of gold, they can find them. <laughs> They're called banks. Uh, so they can, and they did in the 30s, force the banks to hand over the gold. Mm. Probably the main virtue of a Bitcoin standard is that it's less vulnerable to that. It's easier to hide whether you own Bitcoin or not. There's no physical vault. Uh, now, it's somewhat more vulnerable, sorry, somewhat less vulnerable to take over, but not entirely invulnerable. Some Bitcoiners exaggerate how censorship proof it is because governments can drive Bitcoin underground. They can make it illegal to advertise that you accept Bitcoin. They can make it illegal for any financial institution that is open and above board from using, accepting Bitcoin as they have in China. There are still people using Bitcoin in China underground, but being underground means you're not a commonly accepted medium of exchange. It's hard to compete with the incumbent currency while operating underground. The main drawback of Bitcoin is that it's enormously volatile. So you don't want to hold your rent money in Bitcoin because the value of, your rent, of what you're holding could drop 7% in a day. 20% in a week, that happens frequently. Um, and so I don't think it would be very popular as an alternative. People hold it as a speculative investment, but it's not very widely used as a medium of exchange, and I don't think we should expect it to become more widely used. So if all the fiat monies in the world broke down, it seems to me a gold standard is a more plausible, spontaneous, replacement, but of course we don't have to wait for the breakdown of all the fiat standards. We can act proactively to put in something that's a little more, has a, a stronger track record. Uh, but until that happens, you know, we're stuck with fiat money, we need to figure out some way to make it more predictable and less inflationary. Uh, but it's good to have a plan B in case so let me stop here and take questions. Thank you. <laughs> so your plan B is? Plan B is go back to a gold standard or a gold standard. Yeah. Well, you threw a lot of warnings about 